Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Jonathan R. Latham, Ph.D. He's co-founder and executive director of the Bioscience Resource Project and the editor of Independent Science News. Dr. Latham is also the director of the Poison Papers Project, which publicizes documents of the chemical industry and its regulators. Dr. Latham holds a master's degree in crop genetics and a Ph.D. in virology. He was subsequently a post postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Genetics, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has published scientific papers in disciplines as diverse as plant ecology, plant virology, genetics, and genetic engineering. Dr. Latham talks frequently at international events and scientific regulatory conferences on the research conducted by the project. He has written for Truthout, MIT Technology Review, The Guardian, Resilience, and many other magazines and websites. Today we're going to talk about golden rice. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. Second, thank you for being on the program. Hi there, Derek. Thanks for having me. So what what is golden rice? So golden rice is a GMO. Uh, it contains three different trans genes. Uh, one is an antibiotic resistance gene, which is basically irrelevant to its GMO properties. It's just there to, to help developers detect uh, the the product. Basically, because you can't, you know, if you're growing it in tissue culture, you can't find, uh, identify cells that have been uh, manipulated. And then it also has a gene from maize and a gene from a bacteria in it. So these are basically intended to modify the endosperm, the actual grain that you, you know, if you buy white rice, the bit that you, the bit that you buy to modify that, so that it produces from uh, components of the grain, uh, beta carotene, which is pro vitamin A, and that uh, concentration is then elevated in the grain, and the the idea is that that will produce health benefits. So people will be able to uptake vitamin A from white rice, basically, and so the rice the rice ends up being a slightly golden yellowish color. And so first off, why why from their perspective is that good and why from some people's perspective is that bad? Mm. Well, th this is a pretty deep question because because it goes into the kind of the questions of what kind of agriculture do you want? And the 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 idea of the proponents is that, you know, there's a lot of poor people, impoverished people who are basically eating white rice, and that's all they have to, available to them to eat for the most part. And so what they need is, uh, is vitamins to go with that. And so their idea is that they can, uh, can offer a solution, which is to, to add this vitamin, vitamin A, to rice, and therefore improve the, the, the nutrition of these people. The, the concern of people who are not a, a proponents is twofold. So one is that, uh, basically, there will be health consequences to this. You know, the, the rice, for example, vitamin A is beta carotene, and beta carotene is closely related compound to, uh, to, to some that are basically quite serious toxins. So retinols and things like that are toxins. So, so we have uh, various reasons, apart from it being a GMO in the first place and, and kind of unregulated or semi-unregulated uh, manipulation of the genome, uh, there are actually sort of sound scientific reasons to be concerned about the health consequences of this rice. But the, in a way, the deeper question is, you know, do you, what kind of agriculture do you want in the world? Do you want the kind of agriculture where everybody, or where farmers grow monocrops and consumers eat, you know, processed rice and, and white rice and, and monocrop type diets? Uh, that are basically controlled by the agrochemical industry, right? This is basically, it's a, it w fits into a model of agriculture that is not diverse, that is not local, that is not, uh, that is not sustainable, that doesn't involve farmers growing more uh, greens, more carrots, more root crops, and so forth. You know, the history of the history of Asian agriculture is that has been the Green Revolution, basically extirpated all these other crops that were grown at the time in the, you know, historically grown, you know, greens and weeds and all kinds of different food types that people used to eat 
in these crops are basically pushed out in a big kind of effort to to push farmers into growing rice and only rice and only these hybrid varieties of rice and so forth. And what what the people who are concerned about the push for for vitamin A rice, golden rice, uh, is basically that this is a furtherance of that kind of corporate monocrop agenda. Wait, let's let's back way way up and. Um, there are those who argue that um, that agriculture really originated in the in China and not in the Near East with 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 various grains there, but instead with with rice. Mm -hmm. And so, when I think about Chinese agriculture, honestly, I think about rice. And so, mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is that rice was a staple but not but the but but and i don't know this but was mm. was agriculture pre 1950s in mm. asia was it fairly diversified in terms of like well, you're it, saying it there was were the, much more yeah yeah it was much more diversified you know people people used to eat insects that grew in the fields in the rice paddies for example People used to eat fish that grew in the in the paddies. That that uh, so basically you can have you can have all kinds of different species in those paddies, but you can only have them, for example, if you're not spraying vast quantities of pesticides on them. And so basically that kind of diversity basically disappeared at the time. And so you had a you know the historical uh, a kind of record shows that. You know the 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 advent of the green revolution was a you know introduced a crisis an ecological crisis into these agricultural systems because prior prior to that there was there was you know there were some hungry people but for the most part their hunger all had to do with poverty and inequality and so forth but also you know colonial colonialism and the British in in India and other countries. So you had complicated reasons for that poverty, but what you didn't have was generalized hunger and generalized malnutrition, because these, uh, you know, those the narrative of hunger and malnutrition was basically a synthetic one, right? You know, you had uh, basically countries like the U.S. and multinational corporations who basically wanted to gain a stake, a foothold in Asian agriculture, and so they basically manufactured a narrative of hunger and malnutrition, which really didn't exist. It was a fiction. Maybe it existed in, in the cities and so forth with laborers. And so they made up these stories. And But what that basically means is that the history of, of agriculture in those countries was basically one of success. You know, for the, they were feeding their populations. They were feeding them uh, fairly decent quality food, and they generated, uh, you know, fantastic cuisines. And so, so that was the history of that that agriculture. And like you say, it's a very long history, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years or so of, of uh, growing rice and other crops. And perhaps, um, perhaps we should give just a very brief history of the Green Revolution. What do you mean by the Green Revolution? We know that the, the sort of patron saint of it won a Nobel Prize. And we mm -hmm. know that um, among some certain categories of people, the Green Revolution is to this day thought of as a miracle. And among other categories yeah. of people, the Green Revolution is despised as tremendously destructive. So can you give us a five or six or seven minute uh, primer on the Green Revolution and how it applies? Like, what is it? Yeah. And, and how it applies to everything we're talking about. Yeah. So, so briefly, you know, the Green Revolution began in the minds of the Rockefeller Foundation, right? So the Rockefeller Foundation sent uh, agronomists to Mexico. And in Mexico, what they had, this is in the 40s, right, during the war, they had basically a fairly productive peasant type agriculture in which all the citizenry basically lived in the countryside and were relatively self-sufficient. And the Rockefeller roots are oil, right? 
and they realize that, that this kind of system in which people are self-sufficient uh, means that there's not much demand for oil, right? So there is basically, you know, people don't go to the supermarket and buy jam. They grow raspberries and, and turn it into jam themselves using their own, you know, sometimes even homemade containers. And so you basically have a self-sufficient population. And the 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 Rockefeller Foundation was that was that was not to their liking, right? They wanted basically to push people into the cities. Once you push people into the cities, then they become dependent. They become economically dependent, and they become fossil fuel dependent. And so, so they wanted to basically find a way of removing the peasants from the fields. And so, what they did was postulate uh, a problem with uh, Mexican agriculture that needs to be solved by higher yields and higher yielding crops. And the problem with higher yielding crops is that when you succeed, what you do is you overproduce, that drives down the price of the commodity. In this case, it was mostly wheat. And that's how the the Green Revolution started in India, by the way. It was still a continuation of this wheat project. But what happens when you overproduce wheat, then, then basically there's a glut and then the farmers are impoverished because they can't, either can't sell their produce at all because there's a glut or the price is low. So therefore, they, even when they do sell it, they fail to make any money. And so this creates a crisis in the countryside, right? This has been reproduced many times over. You, there's a crisis in the countryside because of a glut of agricultural produce. And so basically, people go into debt. People have to leave their land because they can no longer make a living. You know, what ends up, the, you know, the, the economy transitions from being one in which, you know, people with small areas of land are quite self-sufficient and quite solvent, uh, end up being impoverished and and uh, and, and basically uh, unable to sustain their lifestyles. And so this is what the, the, the Rockefeller Foundation wanted. And so once they kind of perfected their model in Mexico, they then synthesized the idea of a of a food shortage in India, and there was, uh, you know, in the early 70s, there was uh, there were some, uh, you know, bad, relatively bad harvests in India, and so they met, turned this narrative into a one of looming food crisis and looming impoverishment and looming uh, global catastrophe. You know, you might remember Paul Ehrlich. And his you know, gloomy predictions of how we were going to end up in a in a world with people eating each other and so forth. So he was making all these predictions, and so were lots of other people. And but this was a narrative created by the U.S., a narrative created by the Rockefeller Foundation. And and you know the side issue for them, of course, is that once the peasants have been pushed out of agriculture, then agriculture you know, traditional agriculture, which is self-sufficient, agroecological, organic, and so forth, can be replaced by farmers who use pesticides, farmers who use machinery, farmers who use fertilizers, all of which require a massive amount of oil as well. So so this was their, their kind of model for how things were supposed to go in agriculture. And so, so the idea that uh, you can kind of complete this process through the development of golden rice is is basically because, you know, the corporations, the corporations that moved in to take advantage of all these, these peasant crises and rural crises, basically they still don't have full control over the agricultural system. They can't, they don't have uh, farmers all growing hybrid rice, for example. So hybrid rice has to be re Rebought every year, seeds. Farmers don't save their own seeds. Old-fashioned varieties go out of existence, and so on and so forth. So they still don't have full control over agriculture, and so so the companies still would like that. And so this golden rice basically is another is another way for them to 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 sort of cement their control over the agricultural systems of of Asia and other places, because because you know one one of the very important um, uh, kind of background stories of all this is that, you know, we have GMO corn in the U.S. We have GMO cotton. There are various GMO crops, oil seeds and so forth, but there is no GMO rice 
anywhere in the world. And rice is the crop grown more than anything else, and it that feeds more people than anything else, and is a potential yeah. revenue source for agribusiness. But at the moment, no Asian country, you know, firstly, there's been no great idea, you know, no great technological breakthrough of a of a reason to grow uh, GMO rice. But equally, the Asian countries don't want to be first to, to be the ones who introduce GMO rice. Because once you introduce GMO rice, other countries can basically block your imports, for example. So they can say, well, we don't want your con contamination with your GMO rice because it might be dangerous and so on and so forth. So there's been a total reluctance on the part of Asian countries to introduce GMO rice. And, of course, this upsets the biotech industry, it upsets agribusiness, it upsets the chemical industry. And, and so they really want there to be a GMO rice. And this is their, their, also their foot in the door of turning rice production into GMO rice production. So early on when you were talking about the, the early history of, of this, I was thinking about, uh, in Mexico – I was thinking about mm -hmm. apartheid, actually, because the laws of apartheid were put in place for much the same reason, in that the mines had a problem, and that was people lived in self-sufficient communities. And the first laws of apartheid, many of them had to do with uh, trying to get people into a cash economy, because if they live in a subsistence economy and self-sufficient community, there's no reason for anybody to get a job in a mine, because that's just basically going to hell. And so they would pass hut taxes, dog taxes, poll taxes, all sorts of taxes because these taxes had to be paid with cash. And mm -hmm. therefore, somebody, somebody has to get a job. So it seems to me that it's this. And I'm not specifically comparing GMOs to, uh, to uh, apartheid, but I'm saying that they both, mm -hmm. both of them, both the Green Revolution and apartheid spring from that same need for uh, those in power to disallow self-sufficient communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I wasn't aware of that analysis, so that's very interesting. But, but it is, you know, in many ways, the story of agriculture and the story of politics is, is trying to make people into dependents when they weren't dependents before. Yeah, I mean, the, the long history of, of civilization, if you like. Yeah, well, one more thing, as long as we're going to go that direction, um, I'm... Back in my 30s, I read this exchange between an 1830s pro-slavery philosopher in the United States and his northern abolitionist buddy. And they, uh, the pro-slavery philosopher argued that, um, the, uh, that there are land ownership conditions in which it's in the slaver's best interest to own slaves, the capitalist's best interest to own slaves, and land ownership conditions in which it's in their interest not to own them. And it's really simple. If there's a lot of land, that means people have access to land, which means that they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they, have, they, they won't work for you except at the point of a gun, which means you have to enslave them. But if you can make them dependent upon you, like in a city, then um, when you said they were dependent on oil, dependent on all this other stuff, I was thinking, yeah, and they're dependent especially for food, which makes everything else possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, you know, there are people among the elite, you know, who think quite explicitly along along these uh, along these lines. Yeah. So, is there is there uh, significant grassroots? Uh, I'm not talking about governments or NGOs at this point. I'm talking about actual farmers. Is there significant mm -hmm. um, popular uh, opposition to? Uh, the golden rice uh, throughout Asia? Uh, yeah, th I would say that there is. You know, there are a lot of organizations. I mean, they're not, uh, they are in part NGOs and they are in part uh, peasant uh, groups, you know, all over, all over Asia. There are very large peasant groups. You know, there's millions and millions, hundreds of millions of peasant farmers and many of them are very uh, influential in their own countries and and also very activist in their own ways and so so they are you know those those groups and we have the the article we published is basically a statement from 
uh, you know, the reason you, you contacted me is, you know, we published on our Independent Science News website a statement from those uh, those peasant groups and NGOs and, you know, it's totally a coalition, really, uh, from all, all over Asia, you know, from Sri Lanka, from India, from Nepal, from Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Bangladesh, all kinds of countries, uh, all in, in which, you know, these, the peasant farmers recognize golden rice as being a threat. And they see, uh, for example, the whole research program of um, of making of kind of there's a the UN is the centerpiece of a sort of rice breeding project a rice breeding institute there's one in the main one is in the Philippines near Manila called IRI International Research, Rice Research Institute which is basically now being funded by the Gates Foundation to to generate this golden rice. So the golden rice basically started out as a project of Syngenta, and Syngenta's um, uh, sort of offshoot non-profit uh, foundation. And, and didn't the, Syngenta... Been transferred, didn't, yeah, yeah. Didn't Syngenta... Isn't that the name that... Or is this a different company that Monsanto used to be? No, Syng Syngenta is now part of Chem China, but they are British basically okay. agrochemical company. So they're the, one of the European equivalents of Monsanto. Okay. So, you know, there are only three huge uh, agri kind of chemical companies left. And, and Syngenta, uh, Syngenta is now part of ChemChina, and that is, that is one of them. And so, so, you know, it was not a philanthropic project in the first place, right? It was obviously a corporate offshoot. And uh, so these groups from all over Asia are basically opposing it because uh, because it's part of a bigger project too, which is to basically transition rice growing not only into a monoculture but also a monoculture of hybrid rice. So a traditional rice is not hybrid rice; it means you can save the seed. And so that gives farmers a certain degree of independence. And yet there are institutions like the IRI that I just mentioned, International Rice Research Institute, which is nominally maintained by the, by the United Nations, but is actually funded by the Gates Foundation, at least for the, the Golden Rice Project. Is. And so, so they, these groups are basically, they hate IRI. You know, they have demonstrations against IRI. And, and if you, where I live, we're just around the corner from Cornell, and everybody at Cornell thinks that Iri is, you know, a heroic uh, developer of rice and helper of, of small farmers and, and so on and so forth. And they would be really shocked to find out that the small farmers of Asia hate Iri because of its role in promoting pesticides, promoting hybrid rice, promoting monocultures and so forth. So all these things have to be understood in a context, yeah. I think, I think for for probably uh, non, especially for non farmers in the United States, um, I, 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 can you, you know, when if somebody's just going to have a garden, I don't think they particularly care about buying seeds from burpees or some other company for their little garden because it's going to be. Mm -hmm you know, $20 worth of seeds, and it's really fun to look through the seed catalog and all that. <laughs> yeah. But but that is, um, you've mentioned several times farmers being unable to use their own seeds. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about the difference between a, uh, a um, hobby gardener, perhaps mm -hmm. not caring about that, and why this make it might make a life or death difference to a subsistence farmer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the you know, see, firstly, seed is a major expense, right? If you can't, or if you can't, or won't, or don't save your own seeds, seeds can be a big expense. The farmers, farmers in India, for example, who grow cotton. Uh, they plant their cotton too far apart because the seeds are expensive, and then they don't get the yields that they that they hoped for, and so they end up losing money on their crops. And so, so you have companies who are trying to make money from seeds. You know, they're trying to boost the 
the price of seeds. They're trying to make uh, put the technology into the seed, for example. They're trying to make the case that the seed is really, really important. And so what they do is they do things like they discontinue varieties that can, that people can save, for example. I mean, we had, you know, this year, right, I had, I tried to buy uh, for our home garden some uh, sun gold tomato seeds, right? And the only sun gold tomatoes, which I happen to like, and they're a very good variety in my opinion, the only ones that I can buy are non-organic uh, hybrid sun gold. That means that the company itself doesn't want to sell organic seed. That also means that organic farmers can't grow sun gold seeds. That also means that um, I can't, because sun gold is a hybrid, I can't save that seed. Right? If I was to save hybrid seed, the progeny would all come out different from each other. And so I would end up with a whole mess of different tomatoes and that might not matter if I'm a home gardener, but if if I end up, you know, having some tomatoes that are bigger and some that are smaller and some that are less orange and some whatever, then I, it's hard for me to sell my produce, right? It's hard, it can be hard, for example, also, if you grow rice and some, there's different rices, you, you try to disaggregate one of these hybrid seeds and what you end up with is rice that, how, that, that comes ripe on different days. That means you can't go through with a machine and harvest it all in one day. So you've got all these genetic complications that basically are built into the rice that cause the farmers not to be able to save their own seeds. And so one of the problems is they can't always get the varieties they want. And so and that means also that companies can, can uh, basically ex extract profit from those seeds in ways that otherwise would not be possible. So you've got this kind of whole control game going on in the world of, of seeds. And so people don't, you know, home gardeners don't necessarily see this. They see annoying things like what happens with, with, gold, with uh, sun gold tomatoes, that you can't find the types you want, you can't get them as organic seeds, so on and so forth. But this really for many farmers, you know, they can't grow, they can't, if they can't get the corn they need or they can't get it to be non-GMO, then they have to spend a lot of money on the, on the seed. So you've seen, what you've seen in, in American agriculture, for example, is in the last 20 years since uh, GMO has taken over agriculture, uh, you've seen huge increases in the price of seed and you've seen huge consolidation in the seed industry. So you've seen two, basically two things. You've seen less availability of seeds. You've seen huge increase in prices of the seeds that are available and uh and a consolidation of the 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 seed chain, which means that there aren't there aren't choices. But but the ultimate you know, the ultimate driver of all this is Monsanto profits, right? Those companies, Monsanto and Bayer and Dow, have reaped huge profits. From those, you know, you see their stock prices, they've gone, gone through the roof because they're reaping huge profits from these monopolistic practices. So this is the kind of, you know, the, the sun gold tomato story uh, is kind of writ large in American agriculture. And this is what the farmers of Asia are concerned will happen if golden rice goes through, you know. So there's this kind of bigger picture story behind behind the whole thing of what happens when you get corporate control of agriculture, you get high prices and low choices. And so farmers, you know, who are already suffering because of the low prices of their produce, because they're being forced in a sense to overproduce, then squeezed at the, at the buying end of the process too. So it really is important for these farmers that things like golden rice doesn't go through. So the, an, another problem, it seems to me, and let me know if this is not a problem, is there was a person brought me to do a talk in uh, Western Illinois many years ago, and this person absolutely loved prairies and uh, w worked on restoring prairies. And he was very much a purist that he didn't like to bring in seeds from the same species when he was restoring a prairie he didn't like to bring in seeds from, say, 100 miles away because he felt very strongly that 
the local plants had adapted to very precise local conditions. And the way I'm the way I'm going to bring this back to rice is traditionally, and I'm ignorant on this, um, so you can tell me. Traditionally, wouldn't rice variations also have been extremely localized through uh, through six thousand years of selective selective breeding, essentially, so that in mm -hmm. when a rice grower in Korea, in no, not mm -hmm. Korea, when a rice grower in coastal Korea is growing. Mm -hmm. They're going to probably plant a a rice a rice seed that is adapted to the local microclimate, the local everything, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody in India or somebody. Well, again, India is kind of pointless because it's everything from desert to 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 deep forest. So you know, in mm -hmm. this particular location, in this particular um, um, river shed uh, or watershed of India. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. isn't this also, uh, I mean, isn't there a reason for these, there, a reason that these different uh, strains were developed? And isn't that also a tremendous loss to the local farmers to lose the locally adapted seed? Uh, yeah, I, w I would say this, you know, the person, the person who knows most about this, uh, that I'm aware of, his name is Debal Deb, D E B A L D E B. He had an article in the Smithsonian magazine, uh, but he's also written for our website. Um, but his Smithsonian article is really good about this because because he describes, for example, how uh, you know there of course there are geographical variations in rice. You know they have rices. For example, that resists the salinization, rices that resist drought, rices that that uh, you know take grow in short seasons and long seasons, and you know. So basically, historically, farmers would grow all these different kinds of rices, and they'd all be separate from each other, and they'd be saving seeds, and they'd all have you know different egg values to the farmer, but also these rices would have different values. For all kinds of other reasons too. So there were there were rices grown for medicinal reasons. There were rices grown for uh, specific dishes. You know, like the equivalent of arborio rice or whatever. There were rices grown for certain you know um, cultural events. There's a thousand reasons to grow different kinds of rice, and everybody you know everybody takes their rice very seriously. Uh, you know, in the same way in in England. We, we have all these different potatoes that we use for, you know, we use different potatoes for jacket potato, different ones for deep frying, different ones for mashed potato, different ones for roast potatoes and so forth. And that culinary history doesn't really seem to exist in the U.S. People grow Yukon goals that are supposedly all purpose, but actually no purpose potatoes. And and they, so so you have this whole cultural kind of baggage if you like in a positive way you know culture that goes along with growing all these rices so you know what the what the iri and and all this you know the kind of corporatization the hybrid rice all these different um agendas that are going on in in asian agriculture basically uh, are also erasing all these cultural traditions and all this resilient types of rice for example and so so you've got all these you know all these complications that go with it's not just simply introducing short grained high high yielding rice this is not this is not really a proper understanding of what's going on there's a whole there's a whole cultural thing that goes on with that so so for example uh you know the the it's considered there were probably a hundred thousand different rice varieties uh, in India, for example, alone, and so that's like that's a trem tremendous amount of biological and cultural diversity represented there. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions uh, that are going to be really snide, and they're from the perspective of of a very pro GMO type right. perspective. perspective. Mm -hmm. The first one is um, nobody's forcing these farmers to use this rice, why are you against them having the choice of using this rice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, is, what is gonna happen 
with this when these rices are introduced is that the farmers will not want to grow them for the most part. Uh, but the government is going to subsidize this rice. Right? So so this is a government these are governments like Bangladesh that that have shown negligible respect or interest in their small farmers. Uh, all of a sudden subsidizing them to grow a GMO rice. Right? So so you know, in a sense, you're going to be forcing these farmers to grow the rice because in some cases it will be all they can afford to do. So so you've got, you know, you've got a, uh, you know, the the choice is not going to be a free choice. The, the second thing is that, uh, that one of the major, major problems with GMOs is that it totally obviates the whole p uh, polluter pays principle, right? So we have a kind of, you know, it's not a very uh, well-enforced principle, but the kind of one of the ideas of companies making polluting products in the first place is that there's a sort of vague hope that they will pay for their pollution uh, when they produce it. And in the case of rice, what's going to happen is the rice, rice, rice is grown by other people will be contaminated by this golden rice. Right? So if this golden rice turns out to be harmful, or this golden rice turns out to be of low value, or if it turns out to damage the yield, or if it has or any, any one of a very large list of uh, highly probable uh, defects, what's going to happen is they're going to contaminate everybody else's rice because it's wind-pollinated crop. Right? So, so the pollen is going to be growing all over the countryside. And so this has become an issue, for example, uh, in uh, in maize growing in in Canada, basically organic farmers can no longer grow maize, uh, not maize, um, uh, um, mustard in in uh, canola in uh, Canada because every time they try to grow it, their crop becomes pollinated uh, by by neighboring GMO fields, right? And so they're no longer valid as as organic products. And so, so this is what's going to happen in, in rice. This is totally a reality of GMO agriculture, that it basically, basically, uh, basically, it's not a, it creates a situation in which GMOs are not what, you know, what the proponents like to call the tool in the toolbox. They're basically the tool that drives out every other form of agriculture. And part of it is through pollution, and part of it is through price advantages. You know, the history of, of introduction of GMOs all over the world has basically been that governments subsidize agriculture or, or partially subsidize agriculture or set the framework for agriculture. And what they've been convinced to do by, by multinational corporations is provide special breaks for GMOs. Right? So, so, for example... The USDA has a program, uh, I don't know if it's still ongoing, but it certainly it did have a program in which basically you could get crop insurance, and crop insurance is very important to farmers to grow maize, but if you, um, because it insures them against failure, right? It means they can grow the worst crop in the world and still make a profit. But uh, the, the, the condition for getting crop insurance, and crop insurance itself is subsidized, Right? The condition for doing that is to grow a GMO variety. Right? So you're basically the government was basically forcing people, forcing farmers, to, to if they didn't want to go bankrupt, to grow GMO maize. And this is this is essentially what's looking like is, is going to happen with this uh, golden rice in Bangladesh if it ever becomes uh, actually commercialized. This is what the government is talking about: is is, sub, is, is subsidizing that rice. So you have a whole kind of financial system which creates a non-free choice for the farmers. So my next, thank you for that, and my next uh, insulting question from the perspective of a <laughs> uh, pro-GMO perspective is why do you hate poor people in Asia so much that you want them to suffer from vitamin A deficiency? Well, well, the, 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 biggest, the biggest issue here is that it's never been shown to work, right? No one has ever shown that you can take the diet of an impoverished person and substitute the white rice that they're already eating with this rice and improve their health, 
right? There is there is no evidence for that whatsoever, right? So this is this is one of the interesting, interesting philanthropic kind of missing pieces, if you like, is that you would really think that if any if the Bill Gates Foundation was truly philanthropic in giving the the golden rice uh, developers a hundred million dollars. That they would have actually establish that this was actually a useful product for these for these uh, for the eaters, and and we still don't know the evidence for that, and we also haven't had safety testing. So as I mentioned, there is a uh, there is there are good scientific reasons to be concerned about the uh, the safety of this product, and so so you know what what I'm concerned about is that you are basically using poor people as guinea pigs. Right in this instance, those poor people will be offered this rice. They won't understand any difference between that and, and other rices, and they will assume that their government has their best interests at heart, and so they will they will consume this rice, and and it will turn out to be either untested or actually unsafe for them, and and those are the people who can least afford, uh, you know, health consequences from, uh, from uh, defective products. Um, so okay, now now that we're done with the with that direction, I want to go a, a different direction. We're we're just about to start winding down. We have about mm -hmm. s seven or eight minutes left. Um, I want to bring in what seems to be the thesis, or not the thesis, but the overarching uh, principle of everything you've said today is a line by John Mohawk, uh, which is um, there is no sovereignty without food sovereignty. Mm hmm. And so can you comment on that as as it has to do with what we're talking about today? Yeah. I mean, there's good reasons why these groups are aligned with um, food sovereignty movements throughout the world, right? You know, food sovereignty has become a kind of a buzzword. And and the basic idea is that, that you know, politics, politics depends on power. Right? If you if you have power uh, to protect yourself to to um, to basically influence other people and not have them push back and remove you you know remove your source of income or remove your livelihood and so on and so forth, then uh, basically then you have real power. And you know what we've observed time and time again is that people who are in paying jobs. Have you know their power depends largely on their union representation, and if they don't have union representation or that union representation is not very strong, then basically those uh, those groups basically are disempowered. It's very difficult for for those uh, for workers to basically advance their political causes. You know, if you look back through history, uh, U.S. history. You'll see that you know the times that that the elites have felt threatened was basically through through uh, people like the institutions like the IWW, who who basically had models of unionization and models of organizing that were essentially worker-based, union-based, but also you know they were represented the needs of the workers in the in the in the workplace, but also in more wider areas, and so, so what uh, you know, the the basic kind of argument is that, you know, Malcolm X said that I forget the exact quote, but basically, power only only respects power, right? That was his his basic premise, and I agree with that. And so, basically, if you don't have the power to push back against your government, they will steamroll you. If you don't have the power to push back against these multinational corporations, they will basically steamroll you. And so the whole idea of food sovereignty is that, you know, the most basic form of power is to be able to feed yourself, house, house, house yourself, uh, and, and be kind of um, sovereign, at least in your own piece of land. And this was, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson's and various other people had these ideas of democratic uh, democratic land land ownership, in which, for example, you know, if you if you go back to Britain in the 1800s, the whole idea was that that only landowners could vote, right? That was one of the the kind of founding principles of the 
of, of early democracy in Britain. And the idea of it was that, you know, you, you didn't really have a vote. You didn't really have any political power if you didn't own land, if you didn't have a, a, a sort of home base in the country and so forth. You, essentially, your political power was basically meaningless. And so, so, the, um, so that was, you know, it's been a, an idea that's gone back uh, a long way in history. That, that if you don't own land and you don't have access to food, then you really don't have much sovereignty in the world. And so, so people have kind of looked to unions and looked to other institutions, but usually unions to kind of remedy that power problem. But the limitations of that are also quite obvious. And so the idea of food sovereignty has been that, that you know, this, this is a more fundamental idea of power. And, and, you know, the history, for example, of the civil rights movement in the U.S., for example, was that, uh, you know, black farmers had more power than, than black non-farmers and that civil rights activists would be sheltered by, by farmers and landowners uh, and given, you know, uh, a place to live and, and the ability to grow their own food and so forth. They had basically... Uh, you know, the land offers opportunities. The food, be able to grow your own food, offers, offers opportunities for personal resilience, which translate into political power. And so, this is something that that the left in in the U.S. and many other places doesn't really understand. That you know, I've written I wrote an article quite a long time ago now about uh, the food movement being the the true kind of organizing principle and basis of political power in this in this country and 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 the arguments are still good you know that 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 essentially food and land are the basis of power and if you if you want to 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 really make change in the world then you have to respect that principle but also that means grabbing hold of food and grabbing hold of power and some of that has to do with seed power right be able to buy seeds grow seeds they seeds that you that you want and and not the ones that you don't want, for example. So I'm thinking a couple things. One of them is that Kropotkin said that so many revolutions have foundered because of bread, because if you can't feed yourself, it's, he's saying the same mm -hmm. thing you are. If you can't feed yourself, then your revolution is going to stop in 60 days because you starve to death. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the other is, you know, nothing you're saying is news to every military leader who has ever existed. Because what was one of the first things that the North did to the South in the American Civil War is institute a blockade. What did they do and what did the British and everybody else do in World War I and World War II to the Germans? Institute a blockade. And, and why? Because of exactly what you say. If you can't feed your populace, if, if the populace can't be fed, they can't continue. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you can't feed yourself, yeah, yeah. I should say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean we 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 teach ourselves a lot of interesting lessons, right? I mean we have we have school school um, classes in which we talk about you know all these great historical events, but basically we teach this kind of narrative of history that's impoverished in in terms of talking about power. And so, like you say, we talk about World War World War One, for example as being about, you know, battleships and weapons and radar and so forth and all these things that are not, not radar is not World War I, but, but all these technologies that are not really uh, available to ordinary people and yet the, the basic dynamics of what goes, goes on in those struggles are very, very, uh, very clear. You know, you have the, the, the conquering nation conquers a country you know, for example, the German. You know, when the when the when the when the British and Americans invaded uh, Germany after Second World War, the population at the end of the sec Second World War, the population was starving. The same thing with the the First World War. So you've got all these wars that ultimately are really decided as much by food and and these kinds of issues as they are by weapons and and other reasons. Yeah, yeah. So the last. Two questions, or they're, they're combined, is how can somebody um, who, care, who cares about this at all support your work, and how can they support the work of all of these tremendous organizations? Well, actually, before we go there, 
I'm going to say mm. the, the article, the, the press release was independentsciencenews.org slash health slash, and there's hyphens in between words, why we oppose golden rice. So how can they support your work and also um, the work of all of these tremendous organizations, the Alliance of Agrarian Reform Movement in Indonesia, the Asian Peasants Coalition, um, the uh, a lot of these I can't pronounce, which is why I'm not saying them. Um, yeah. Mon yeah. in Sri Lanka, uh, Orissa in India. How can they, the Pesticide Action Network, Asia Pacific, how can they support uh, any of these organizations? Yeah, I mean, those, those organizations could use money for sure. The, the, um, you know, and it is possible to, you know, if you contact, if people contact me or they contact, uh, I'm not even sure if the Stop Golden Rice Network has a website, but I can certainly uh, put people in touch with them. And a little bit of money probably would go a long way. You know, it's, these, are, these are countries where, where money goes further than, than in the U.S. And, uh, you know, in the, in the, same, the same thing applies to our um, independent science news and our nonprofit. But, you know, as much as anything, we would like people to share our content. You know, we produce all this content that is innovative, interesting, and, and radical and, and important. And so we would like people to share our content. And also, the last, very last thing is to be a member of our, uh, to, be, to be on our uh, mailing list. Because, you know, we're more and more uh, nervous about being censored by Facebook and Twitter and, and everybody else. It can be hard to find our content. And so the value of sharing it, the value of being on our mailing list is simply that otherwise our work will be invisible. <clears throat> Well, I'm 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 so glad to help in whatever small way to make your work visible. Um, anyway, thank you so much for your work in the world, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Jonathan Latham. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>